All right, guys. So I think I'm on. Um, I normally broadcast from my phone and I got a message saying that I can no longer broadcast from my phone because um, you have to have 1,000 subscribers to do that. So um, I know the video quality on here is not as great, but um, yeah, we'll go with what? We'll go with it. And um, one second, let me plug up my computer and we'll get started. All right, are you guys able to hear me and see me okay? Yes, all right, excellent. Okay. It's really grainy on my side, so I don't know if it's as grainy to you guys as it is to me, but um, we'll just go with it. And um, hope that that gets its stuff worked out. All right, well, let us pray. And then we will get started. Lord, we're so thankful for you and your grace. And we just ask that you would be with us as we come together to continue in our studies Lord, help us to really understand what it is that you're trying to teach us so that our lives may be different, which would in turn cause the lives of our family to be different. Lord, help us and teach us to depend on you fully. Be with our tech issues um, and just guide us in the way that you would have us to go that this message might get out, that your people might be helped according to your perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right, guys. So I'm apologizing for us not being able to do our normal time today, but I have quite a few things going on. Um, and we may even soon have to change our time for a short period, but we'll talk about that later. We'll see what happens. So we are discussing chapters 41 and 42. And on our calendar, we went through most of chapter 43, but I'm not sure that we're going to cover it today just because we didn't finish the whole chapter. And then next week, like the whole week, we're in chapter 44. So I thought maybe we'll do two chapters today. And then next week, we'll do two chapters. And we'll just kind of spend, um, you know, 25 minutes or so in, in each chapter. So I feel like since we're just doing a review, um, that should do us okay. And if you notice... Um, some of these chapters are really long, and so that's why we tried to break them up, um, usually at least into two days, sometimes three, or I think it, even a couple chapters when we started doing some of the calendars for the later um, chapters. Some of them are like four days because they're just really long, and we're only meeting for 30 minutes, and there's just, you know, as you guys know, just, I mean, there's only so much you can cover in 30 minutes and have it be meaningful. So let's begin with objectives of discipline. Now, I'm gonna say again that you'll notice through this book and really just kind of through Christianity in general, there, there really just are a few themes and you know, everything can be broken down to just a few themes. And discipline is one of those. So a lot of the issues 
that you're having with yourself, with your children, um, they really just go back to lack of discipline. And so um, when you find that you get on task, you create a schedule, you learn how to stick to it, then you will also find that many of the problems that you were having um, just kind of went away because they're associated with and related to not having um, a plan or some semblance of order in your life. Self-government, the paramount objective. Now, this is so important because the goal of discipline is not to punish our children. And it's almost sad that we have to say that, but the way that many of us have grown up, the way that we have been taught, um, the way that our society is tends to be in one ditch or the other, you know, it, it may just not be apparent that the objective of, of discipline is not punishment. The objective of discipline, and we'll just read it here because it says it really nicely. The, the object, excuse me, of discipline is the training of the child for self-government. He should be taught self-reliance and self-control. Therefore, as soon as he is capable of understanding, his reason should be enlisted on the side of obedience. Let all dealing with him be such as to show obedience, as to show obedience to be just and reasonable. Help him to see that all things are under law and that disobedience leads in the end to disaster and suffering. When God says, thou shalt not, he in love warns us of the consequence of disobedience in order to save us from harm and loss. Now, this is also important because we have here in the, is that the second sentence? He should be taught self-reliance and self-control. And I think we kind of talked about this on the call, but to reiterate it, and for those who may not have been on the call, um, this is not self as in we're depending on self. Right. So I think it's important to make that distinction because we don't want to depend on self. Right. We want to depend on God. The self-reliance and self-control means that the power is going to be transferred to the child. Right. It's not the it's not the parent's objective to control the child. The objective is to teach the child how to be in control, right? And even then, we're not saying we're in control because God is in control, but to take control, to be proactive, to not always just be responding to things that have happened. And what is so interesting is as we go through these lessons, so. I, I am a counselor, right? Like not by education, I've never had classes or I don't have a license or anything like that, but one of my spiritual gifts is counseling. And so more recently, probably in the last couple of years or so, um, I've been getting calls from like random people. Some of them come through sunlight, um, but a lot of them come through just a person that I've talked to and then they recommend me talk to another person. So I'm counseling these people. I don't know them. I barely know the person that recommended them to me. Um, and so just this week, um, I was talking with the lady and we were, we were going back to her childhood. She's having issues. And one of the things that we were able to uncover is that she's never been taught how to deal with issues. Her mother just did everything or just told her what to do. Um, and so she often finds herself reacting when she should be responding and being proactive. So that's one of the things 
we started working on this week um, because she recognized that there's a problem, but then she just kind of panics. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? What are you supposed to figure it out? Because that's what adulting is, right? So why do I say that? Because this woman is, is grown. She has children. She's married. Um, so if you master these lessons when you are a child, then when you get to be an adult, it'll be in a different um, sphere or on a different level, right? It's kind of like child. So you have trials when you're a little kid. You have trials when you're older. They're just different because you're older and they're a little more intense. So I was just noticing that there was just a lot of principles that she just had never learned as a child. So now as an adult, I'm helping her to learn them so she can implement them into her own life first and then teach them to her children. And as adults, as mothers, as fathers, whoever may be listening, this is important because we want to make sure that we are learning these lessons that we may not have learned when we were younger because our parents didn't teach us. Maybe they did things for us um, in, in whatever capacity. But the point is, these are fundamental lessons that have to be taught because if they're not taught, then you'll, you'll build the house, but it will be built on sand, on shaky foundation. And then now the house falls over. And you're like, oh no, what happened? Because the house was beautiful. But you know, it doesn't matter how beautiful the house is if, if the foundation is not um, of any value. All right. Okay. And I do want to read this next paragraph because I think it's very important. Enlisting the power of the will, the true object of reproof is gained only when the wrongdoer himself is led to see his fault and his will is enlisted for its correction. When this is accomplished, point him to the source of pardon and power. Those who train their pupils to feel that the power lies in themselves to become men and women of honor and usefulness will be the most permanently successful. Okay, so very powerful paragraph, probably in need of a little explanation, just like we explained the other one. So I'll do that. The true object of reproof is gained when, not sometimes, not most of the time, not occasionally, only when the wrongdoer himself is led to see his fault, okay? And then his will is enlisted for his correction. What does that mean? You can't force your children to be sorry. We've said that a lot of times on this channel. I don't know how many else times to say it. Um, if you're honest with yourself, no one can force you to be sorry. They can force you to say that you're sorry, but they can't force you to be sorry. Right? I mean, you just, you can't you can't force that. Now you can say, look at the child and say you're sorry now and mean it. But when you think about that, like that is. <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? And please forgive me if I'm offending anyone because that's what you do. But you can't you can't force people to be sorry. You you can't. Now, here's what you can do because we're talking about balance here. So no, we're not forcing the child to say that I'm sorry, but we're also not just letting the child act however they want. And because they're not sorry, then they just go on with life. That's the other dish on the other side of the road. We're not doing that either. Okay. What we're doing is we're acknowledging that we have an issue. And now we have to deal with the issue. And the principle or the goal of dealing with the issue is right here in this paragraph. Only when the wrongdoer himself is led to see his fault and and his will is enlisted for his correction. So notice this conjunction that marries these two statements together. So we're leading the child to see 
that they are in the wrong. This is this is not a um, you know you did wrong, right? No, no. This is you're putting the facts out there. You're you're being very gentle with the child. Now, the truth of the matter is, most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, the child will know that what they have done is wrong. Now, they might not be sorry for doing it, but that is completely separate from knowing that it's wrong, okay? Um, and I'm sure you've heard people say, mm, I know I was wrong for doing that, but I did it anyway. And given the chance, they probably do it again. So knowing that something is wrong and being sorry for it, the, they are not one and the same. Those are two different things. So the first place that you wanna start is to get the child to acknowledge that what they did is wrong. And, and usually you won't have any problem with that. Now, once you get the child to acknowledge that what they have done is wrong, now you're going to coach, can we use that word? Teach, instruct um, the child how to go about, what could I have done differently? Number one, how did I get to this place of being in the wrong? At what point did I make the wrong decision, right? Um, and then how can I repair, restore, make right what, what I have done wrong? And so th this could be a process of a couple minutes. This could be a process of a couple hours. And some children, it's a process of a couple days. And so it's, it may not change overnight because you may have that one child that they get in a fight with the brother and sister and, you know, five months later, remember that time we were standing in the living room and you hit me? <laughs> in fact, my brother is like in his 30s and he still does that. I'm like, what? So <laughs> you may have one of those. Um, and so you still going to go through the process. It'll just be um, <laughs> a little, a little longer. All right. Let's go to page 224. And in this paragraph where it talks about break down Satan's strongholds, at the bottom, it says, let us look carefully and begin to catch up our drop stitches. Let us break down the strongholds of the enemy. Let us mercifully correct our loved ones and keep them from the power of the enemy. Do not be discouraged. So, I shared this on the line. I'm a knitter and I should have bought a knitted piece. Anyway, I don't have one um, right here with me. But if you've ever knitted or if you've ever seen knitting or maybe you've, you've never even knitted, but you've had a sweater and you get kind of a, a run in it um, where the knit stitches are. That's usually from a drop stitch, a stitch that has um, it's either broken or something. And so then it it drops it. It, um, it releases from the stitch that it was hanging onto and then it falls, it's literally falling down the chain because when you knit, you, you know, you knit in a chain and then all the stitches are connected one on top of the other. So a drop stitch is a stitch that for whatever reason, when you were knitting in the round, when you got to that stitch, you skipped it. And so it hasn't been hooked onto or tied into the rest of the knitting. And so it's just kind of hanging out. And so it starts up here and then it starts to fall down. It starts to drop through the levels of your knitting. And sometimes depending on what you're knitting, especially if you're doing like a, um, what do you call it? Um, knit pearl. I don't know. I'm losing my words here. Anyway, you guys know what I'm saying. If, 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 if you knit, um, like what you do on the cuff, um, the word's not coming to me now, but because the stitch is kind of hide behind each other. And so you may not see it, you know, until you get back to it and you're like, oh no, my stitch is way down here. And so if what you're knitting is a very simple pattern. You just have one row that's all knit, one row that's all pearl, or even if it's a pattern, 
knit purl, knit purl, but it's a, it's a pretty simple pattern. Then you can take a hook and you can go down and you can pull up the stitch. And if it's, um, if it's all one row, let's say it's a knit row, then you just pull up, pull up, pull up. So you're literally following how my hand is going. You're going in and grabbing the loop, you're pulling out. You're going in, you're pulling out. So if it's staggered, then you have to go in and then you have to pull it back the other way because it has to go like it's weaving back in and out like this, okay? But then if you have a complex pattern, you know, who knows how you fix that? You may not be able to fix it. You may have to unknit what you've done and then go back to where the stitch has dropped. Like you secure it where it is, and then you have to go back and unknit to that spot so you can pick it up and put it correctly in the pattern where it should go. So the reason that I love this is because this is a perfect example, illustration of, um, how we have to go about with the discipline and training of our children because there will be some things that you haven't done correctly that you have dropped off along the way that you know you can kind of pull it up to par you can implement some things but there may be some things that you just have to stop everything that you're doing you have to deal with this one issue because you're not going to be able to move forward until you deal with this um, one issue. So just um, and stronghold is a wonderful term because, you know, you're, you're literally just kind of held in place that like you, you, you can't do anything until you get break the power of the stronghold which is going to come through prayer and Christ says of some, you know, these things come only by prayer and fasting. And so that's why we have the 40 days of prayer and fasting, because there are some things in your life, some things in the lives of your children that talking is just, is not going to work. Um, and even just praying is not going to be enough. You're going to have to pray and you're going to have to fast that the power of the enemy might be, released that God might reign in your household and in the hearts of your children. All right, um, let's move on to obedience from principle, not compulsion. So this is kind of right in harmony with what we've been talking about. We, we don't want our children to obey because we're forcing them to obey. We want them to obey because they understand the principles of what is right. And this is no different from what God wants from us, right? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He doesn't want us to keep the commandments just because he wrote them, just because he's God and we're not. Um, he's, he's not that kind of God. He wants us to come into a loving relationship with him. And then because we love him so much, we would never want to do anything that would disappoint him. And so we'll be like Joseph and, and say, how, how can I do this thing and, and sin against God? How, how could I do that? There's no way that, that I could do that. And so this is the relationship that we want to build with our children. We want them to be knit, there's that word again, and tied so closely to our heart that they, they wouldn't want to disappoint us. Um, not because we're gonna be mad. Um, I remember this story of Stephen Bohr. I think, I don't know if I shared this before, but he shared this story of he was a little boy. He was living in Panama, wherever he grew up. Um, and he had gone to school and they, he and his friends had found some money. And instead of turning the money in, they went to the store and bought candy. Um, and the principal or someone from the school called his mother. Well, they called him into his office and found out what was going, going on and got to the bottom of it. 
And when he got home, the school had called and told his mother what had happened. And he didn't get in trouble, but his mother said to him with tears in her eyes, I am so disappointed in you, you know better. He said, I would have rather taken a hundred lashes <laughs> than see the look in my mother's face of disappointment. He, he just would have rather his mother just taken a belt and just beat him than to endure the heartbreak of knowing that he had broken her heart because she was a missionary and she had raised him to be a good little boy. and He was not being a good little boy. Um, and what is the point? He he cried because his mother was hurt and he never stole again and he never did that again. Not necessarily because it was wrong, but because it hurt his mother and he didn't want to hurt his mother. Now, of course, he knew it was wrong. But the point is, when we when we bring our children into loving relationship, then we won't have to spend so much time on what is right, what is wrong, don't do this, do that, don't do this, because they they will want to please us from the love that comes from the relationship that um, we have. And, and there's something powerful about God's love, right? So you have the motherly love that comes naturally. Your children, you know, have a love for you that is natural because they're your child. But we want to have and for our children to experience the love that comes from God, which is far superior um, to, to that of even a mother's love. Like the love of God is, is not even humanly um, sensible, right? I think we could say that. So someone hates you and then you die for them. Like that's not, that's not humanly sensible. That's God's love. And that's the kind of love we want to have. And that's the kind of love we want to teach our children to have. So we want to teach them to obey from principle, which stems from obedience of love. All right. Um, and then also this paragraph about the youth responding to trust. And where's that sentence? Here we go. If pupils receive the impression that they cannot go out or come in, sit at the table or be anywhere, even in their rooms, except they are watch, a critical eye is upon them to criticize and report. It will have the influence to demoralize and pastime will have no pleasure in it. So we can actually demoralize our children by always being suspect of them, um, always assuming that they have done wrong. And um, I remember a situation and I won't go into detail here, but my, my father accused me of something when I was, I don't know, I wasn't very old, maybe 13, 12 or 13. Um, and it wasn't true, but he kept accusing me of it. And after a while, I, I just didn't care anymore. Um, and then it became true a couple of years later because I, I just felt like, well, if you're going to just keep accusing me of this, you know, then it just might as well be true. And so I hate and regret that I ever made that decision. But I just remember the feeling of thinking, what is the point of being accused of something that you haven't done? and being treated like you have done it. Um, and so in my immature mind, um, I did it. And so we don't want to be the cause of our children doing something that they never would have done, except the, we accuse them um, of doing it. So we just want to be very careful of that. All right. Um, I think this, this next Paragraph is kind of just enforcing and enlarging upon what we've already said, self-government versus absolute authority. So we want to teach the children to govern themselves. 
and we we don't want to be lording over them. Um, obviously, there's a balance. We don't want them to leave them just doing whatever they want. But they're they're not robots to be controlled, and then you just do what I say, and then you don't have any mind of your own to think about it. Um, and then evil results when one mind dominates another. We don't want to be we don't want to dominate our children. They're not animals, um, and so sometimes I think we give our dogs more freedom than we give our children. So they're 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 not animals. They're not to be dominated and, and just told what to do. Antoinette says, this is a tough one for me. It's so hard not to be suspicious, especially if there's a track record of a child not being trustworthy. That's true. And, and I hear that. Um, I think a way to deal with that, that is most helpful is sometimes children become untrustworthy, even to the point of lying, because we have been so overbearing, right? And so they're almost afraid to tell us the truth because they've, they've messed up, something has gone wrong, but if they come and confess that they messed up, then they get a harsh treatment or just something that is just very unpleasant and unappealing to them. And so while I'm not suggesting that our children um, should not be disciplined, I am suggesting that we want to be very careful about how we treat them when they've done wrong. Um, we, we want to be understanding enough and loving enough that no matter what they've done, they can come to us and 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 tell us the truth. Um, and I remember one of my cousins that had grown up with my grandmother. He was using drugs, um, and he came in the house. And my grandmother knew. My grandmother knew. She was one of those people that could lift your forehead and know you were pregnant. So she knew that he had been using drugs. We didn't know, um, but he came in the house. And she said, have you been, I don't remember, she said, have you been smoking or have you been using drugs? She asked him the question. And he said, no, grandmama. And she looked at him and she she looked him in the eyes and she said, baby, don't ever lie to grandmama. Because if you lie to grandmama, she won't be able to trust you and she won't be able to help you. So always tell grandmama the truth. Um and she did not raise her voice, which is, I remember was a yeller. <laughs> so she was very calm. Um, and he confessed that he had been doing something. He didn't have any business. Um, and from then on, he, she was able to get him some help because he was honest. But I really believe that she was able to save him from himself because of the way she responded to his wrongdoing. Um, so obviously not suggesting that that, is your issue, but that's just one thing to consider that we um, are not creating an environment that makes it difficult for for the child to be to be honest and to share what.